tonight, please open up to Isaiah chapter 30. Isaiah chapter 30. Chapter 30. You say, Pastor, there are a couple of chapters that we have not uh, preached in our messages through Isaiah. And that is so. And perhaps we've preached them at other times when we've gone through the series. But uh, I've learned that it is impossible to preach every word of the Scripture in every study, or you'll be like some men that have written commentaries where they write a commentary. For instance, I'm thinking of one individual who wrote a commentary on Romans, and it was a commentary actually after he had preached through Romans. And he preached through Romans, I think, for about 10 years in every service in his church, and then he turned it into a commentary. I don't know if he had anyone left in his church after 10 years or not. Sometimes I feel as though you know, there's so much that needs to be preached in a book that we're in a series for a very long time, and we need to get the whole counsel of God. And so getting the whole counsel of God does require, and I have not mentioned this in quite a while, I feel somewhat remiss not having done so, but does require personal Bible study along with the series. And so we're very predictable right now. You know that on Wednesday evenings, if I'm preaching, I'll probably be preaching from Isaiah, and so it would be very appropriate for you to be studying in Isaiah, and uh, even if you, as you're studying, I had this happen some when we were preaching through Hebrews the last time, I had some people come up and just say, I've got some questions, and that was a real help to me in preaching the book, to be able to say, hey, you know what, we're going to hit some points here that I believe will be very helpful to some folks, and so I encourage you, uh, don't fall into the rut of studying the Bible fruitlessly. A lot of believers do. A lot of people read the Bible religiously but not spiritually. You understand the difference? In other words, I think everybody ought to have read through the Bible at some point in time. Surprisingly, a lot of Christians who have been saved for a lot of years who actually do a lot of reading of other things have not actually read from, uh, from Genesis to Revelation in the Bible, and everybody ought to do that, and I think it's appropriate to systematically do so. It's fine to read through the Bible a couple of times of the year, or whatever your plan for that is, but don't pass over getting fed for getting your job done. And I think a lot of times we read through the Scripture, and maybe we'll highlight a little thing, but we've got to get through or we're not going to make it to where we're going, and so we can never stop and be where we're at. And uh, it's really important to have positive, fruitful Bible study. Here's a question, and this again, this isn't we're not in our text this evening, I'm just chatting with you right now, but here's a question that I used to have when I was a Bible college student. My question was, is it okay to have your devotions in the portion of the scripture that you're preaching? And my answer for it is, if you're going to study and put any kind of time into it, it needs to be the thing that really is encompassing all of your focus and your attention. It's really tough not to preach what you're studying if you're a preacher. It's tough not to preach what you're studying. And so if you want to be able to stay on topic at all, you better be studying what you're preaching. And so it's a simple answer. And you know, I know pastors that say, oh no, your personal devotions and your personal getting fed needs to be separate from your ministry. My friend, we do not compartmentalize our relationship with God or our service to the Lord. We are servants for the Lord and everything we do involves that. And so go ahead and be free. Get in the Word of God, get fed, enjoy it, but let your brain function and don't just buy into rhetoric. There are things that are helpful, but maybe they're helpful for a, for a season of life or for a period of time. I think everybody ought to have a time when they read through the Bible uh, in a year or just read through the Bible systematically and get it done. I have people that this year have encouraged my heart by saying, I'm reading through my Bible this year for the first time in my life. That's encouragement to me. To hear that. I know it'll change their lives. But that doesn't mean that's the only thing that you can do or the only way that you can do it. So get fed. Okay, so uh, I would encourage you, as, as I was beginning to say, that I don't preach every verse when we preach through a series. If we did, we would be, we would be in a series for years and years upon end, and uh, it would become the joke. Yeah, okay, well, what's Pastor going to preach tonight? Let's find it belabor things and do a good job, but it's another thing when you never finish it. So we're in Isaiah chapter 30 this evening, and the reason for that is a lot of the material prior to this portion has fit within the same genre, helping us to understand the same character of God. Last week, we were actually in chapter 25, which was kind of a tying up or a summary of God's curse 
to all the nations. Literally, if you read up to chapter 25, you would see that systematically at the known time, or at the time that Isaiah was penning the scripture, Isaiah addressed every people group in the known world and God's imminent judgment for them, which helps us to understand that God is the God of all men. He's not just Israel's God. He's not just an exclusive God. If God has judgment for all men, then he's the God of all men. And so that also tells us that God cares about all men. He's concerned about all men. And so the wickedness of the wicked is not unseen or unknown to God. And we even saw the week before that I preached in Isaiah that God uses even the wicked who are the instrument to judge his people. God uses them. God is in control. They are an axe or they are a sword or they are a rod in God's hand. They're the rod of his anger but they are also the one who is going to receive God's anger themselves for not humbling themselves before God. I've oftentimes thought about whether it would be better to be captive Israel or to be Nebuchadnezzar. You ever ask yourself that question? Had I rather be Nebuchadnezzar or would I rather be Israel? And it's a pretty tough question to ask. And my simple answer would be, if God's people have to go into captivity, I don't want to be the one who is being used of God to judge them. Nebuchadnezzar had a pretty unique role. And God certainly humbled the man, and God certainly used the man. And that is previous to what we'll see. We'll be seeing the, what's coming with Nebuchadnezzar as we study through Isaiah. But this evening, let's begin to look at, at Israel and Egypt. And I just want to read a simple passage and make a couple simple points, and we'll be finished tonight. Chapter 30, verse 1, we'll read down to verse 7. Woe to the rebellious children, saith the Lord that take counsel, but not of me, and that cover with a covering, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin, that walk to go down into Egypt, and have not asked at my mouth, to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh, and to trust in the shadow of Egypt. Therefore shall the strength of Pharaoh be your shame, and the trust in the shadow of Egypt your confusion. For his princes were at Zolan, and his ambassador came to Hanes. They were all ashamed of a people that could not profit them, nor be of help nor profit, but a shame and also reproach. The burden of the beasts of the south into the land of trouble and anguish, from whence come the young and old lion, the viper and fiery flying serpent. They will carry their riches upon the shoulders of young asses, and their treasures upon the bunches of camels to a people that shall not profit them. For the Egyptians shall help in vain and to no purpose. Therefore have I cried concerning this. Their strength is to sit still. Their strength is to sit still. And that's rather ironic, isn't it? When sometimes our strength could be to sit still. Father, thank you for your word. And I pray that you would help us to be warned by it this evening. We ask in Jesus' name. Woe to the rebellious children. There are so many parallels in the description of the rebellious child here to what is the norm of God's people. And by God's people, I'm saying these individuals are called children, and we are God's children. And I recognize that not all of Israel is saved. I recognize all that, not all that name the name of Christ and actually understand uh, what it means to name the name of Christ. Sometimes it's Christian is a label, but it is not a faith in the Savior. And so, I understand that, but there are parallels in the activities of what's described of God's people, the nation of Israel. The first word is one that is, is uh, scary. My mom uh, was a first-generation Christian, and she used to speak in biblical terms sometimes. And believe it or not, there were periods of time when she would say, Whoa! And it scared me pretty good. Woe unto the rebellious children. And I was, you know, the rebellious children, uh, plural or singular as the case may be. Um, so she helped me understand the word perhaps more than some of us do. But the word is a frightening word. In other words, it, it, the word carries with it the concept of impending doom and judgment. It carries with it the concept of literally crying out, having cry of anguish for the person to whom the pronouncement is directed toward. In which that would be the children of Israel. And so you're in a lot of trouble. Not only in a lot of trouble, but you're going to be crying out. You're going to be in anguish. You're going to be 
warned, Woe unto rebellious children. Well, who is saying this? Well, the Scripture says, saith the Lord. If God says you're in trouble, you are. If God says you're in bad shape, you're in bad shape. And here we're going to see the description that helps us to understand what has gotten the people where they are. And the first thing we see is that they seek counsel. <laughs> they seek counsel. Now, if you read in Proverbs, you're saying, well, good. A wise son does that, right? Seeks counsel. And yet what we find here is that they take counsel, but not from God. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And his law doth he meditate day and night. I am not going to make this evening blanket statements. So please understand, I'm making general statements this evening. But most counsel that is sought by God's people is not sought from God. Most counsel sought by God's people is counsel that is not sought from God. I don't know where the whole Christian psychiatrist, psychologist, and where the whole, uh, we have a term which is supposed to mean biblical counsel, nuthetic counseling, and so forth. I don't know where every individual that is exercising or emphasizing man's counsel and I will call it man's counsel because it's a man who is the counselor. I don't know where that fits individually, but I will say as a whole, it is not of the Lord. I don't know that in every single instance that a person is prescribed medication to control how they feel or how they think. I don't know that every instance that that is done that the Holy Spirit offers to that individual that he will fill them so that they do not need to be dependent on a substance. I don't know that that would be true in each instance, and perhaps it is not, but I would say this, most of the time, the individual who seeks those who prescribe those things to them have not sought God and His counsel as much. It's amazing how much we'll ask questions. I think we ask Google more than we ask God about things quite often, don't we? I can say, I better be careful right now. I might, my phone might come back and say something. I could say, okay, Google. And my phone would tell me what I want to hear. Did anybody's phone go off when I said that? Okay. But I could say something. I just say, okay. And that boy is listening to me and I'm seeking his counsel. You can tell me something and I'll verify it like pretty quickly because I'll say, oh, And my phone will say, beep. And then I'll say what I want to know. And it'll come back and sometimes it'll, It'll actually speak to me. Sometimes it'll say, here's an article that you can look at, or here's, uh, here's you know, what this encyclopedia or whatever says about it. And uh, we do that pretty often during a week. You know, that's one thing if you're asking for directions. But you know, it's another different thing kind of all entirely when you're trying to figure out how to do something that you're helpless for. You know, I wonder how often with a physical problem we seek... I'm not, I'm not anti-doctor. I'm not anti-medicine at all. Only a little bit. Because I think that we should seek the Lord first. I think that we should find out. Now, God, should, should I use things that you've created and made? Well, perhaps so. Google, what can I do instead of going to the doctor? Well, perhaps that's a good idea. Okay, that's one physical thing, but what about things that have to do with how we feel and how we think and how we hold and have relationships? I'm just telling you, my friend, we listen to other Christians. We listen to non-believers. It's amazing how many believers post their problems on Facebook. I hope I don't do that. Anybody remember me posting a problem on Facebook? Anybody think of anything besides scoring derision or making fun of millennials? on Facebook from me. I hope not. You know why I don't post problems on Facebook? I don't even usually post. Sometimes I, you know, I'll let people know something that other folks need to know about. The reason I don't do that is because I don't want to have people tell me what to do or how to respond or comfort me. I need the Lord to do that. 
here are people who are in a lot of trouble. And the reason they're in a lot of trouble, and the reason this impending judgment is coming is because of their sin. And if they'd actually ask counsel of God, say, God, where did I go wrong? God would tell them. Remember the theme of Isaiah? What does God want? Yeah. Righteousness and judgment. Righteousness and judgment. But instead they said, you know what? The Egyptians haven't been conquered yet. Maybe they know a thing or two. There's a little history here, isn't there? Isn't there a little history here? For this group of people that's looking to Egypt? Historically, they had a tendency to go to Egypt, didn't they? And historically, that had a tendency to lead them into bondage. And God delivered them from Egypt. And who are they looking to for help when they need deliverance? Egypt. God says, well, and then they seek counsel, but not of me. And then He said in verse 2, that walk to go down into Egypt and have not asked at my mouth. Do you see the beauty of the language here? They walk to Egypt, but they don't ask at my mouth. A dear saint, dear lady that was in the church, really a lady that I think was just an enormous encouragement to Melissa and I in our ministry. Remember Jeannie Barker, Melissa, at, uh, in uh, West Park Baptist Church? What a sweetheart of a lady. She used to just always try to help me. I was a young assistant pastor, and any time I had a task, she'd say, uh, Pastor Price, if you ever need anything. She was a secretary uh, long before retirement uh, for a very, very uh, important uh, CEO or something like that. And I believe it was New York City. And uh, she just was really good at organizing, getting things done. And she'd say, you know, you can do a lot of walking on the telephone. She'd say, you know, if you give me some things too, like if I was organizing an event, before she, she'd say, I'll go pick up things for you. I'll go to the whatever. But she'd call and she'd find out, do you have this? What's the price? Uh, could, could you help with this? I remember I needed some pool balls, billiard balls. I'm making one of those carpet ball tables, and she got me billiard balls. And you know something? All the places I would have gone, that I, she said, well, I'm going to call about it. I'm gonna say, I'll get those for you, but I'm going to call about it. Where do you think would have them? All the places I told her didn't have them. Well, she called around in about 30 minutes found out where billiard balls were. If I went to get those things, it would taken me a couple days to go all the places I thought that had them that didn't. And so she would say something like, you can do a lot of walking on the phone. And here's the picture. Here's the analogy, the illustration of this. God says, you walk to Egypt, but you don't talk to me. Which is quicker? You know, the road to Egypt. Not exactly a fertile safe route. In other words, you'd rather walk to Egypt than you would just to say, God help me. Friend, do we not sometimes rest in our strength, even as believers, so much that we will go to great lengths, terrible expense, and extreme consequence, rather than to simply call out to God? And God hates that. God hates that. You say, well, you know, I don't think God wants a helpless Christian. I think He does. I think He wants a Christian who's honest, and if He's helpless, He ought to be honest about it. Does God want a helpless Christian? Well, listen, if you're helpless, that's what God wants. He's made you helpless, so you'll look to Him. And we oftentimes take the very thing that God has put in our lives to turn us to Him and to teach us what we need to learn and to grow us or convict us and instead of that very thing, my friend, we just take off on a tear to get somewhere. And we don't know where we're going, but we're on the way fast. I like to read. I haven't gotten to read anything new from him in quite some time. I don't even know if he writes anything new. Patrick McManus used to write in Field and Stream. Anybody here read Patrick McManus ever? It isn't always appropriate, so I'm not saying I'm not endorsing him necessarily this evening, but he's actually a hilarious guy. And it's hilarious because of his insight into the macho human nature, particularly of men and sportsmen, and he really, really zones in on it and makes a lot of fun of it. One of the, he write, writes a lot of articles, he writes article, one article that he wrote was about how to panic properly. And so, you know, he talks about when you get lost. He says, it's not if you get lost, he says when you get lost. You know, how, you know, he says, you know, the, the, if you read the survival books, he says they, 
say don't panic. He said, well, that's stupid. You panic before you ever remember that. He said, so what I want to help you with is how to control panic. And so he gives a couple of illustrations of panics. He said, I've led many a panic in my day. He said one time, he said we, uh, he said we, uh, I, he said my, my friend, he has his friend, um, his childhood friend he mentions a lot. He said my friend and I, I think it was Retch or uh, whatever the guy's name was. He said we were in a panic and he said we were running and we passed a couple of loggers who saw us running and they didn't even stop to find out we were running before they took off running with us. And he said the swath of trees that we cut down was uh, so wide that later on they used it for a fire trail, you know. And he just has a real insight into panic. But he said, you know, he said, I've learned, he said, you know, you have to be macho about your panic. He talked about how one time his wife, Bun is her name, his wife Bun saw a, uh, came walked up on a snake. And he said she just sat there jumping up and down chittering, <laughs> just shaking. He said, and he said, I realized it was a pretty practical way to panic because she didn't get lost you know, when she panicked. And so his recommendation was to learn how to make a macho. And he said, so maybe Ray break out in like a Russian song and uh, jump up and down when you're frightened. And he said, and then, you know, that'd be a good way to, and then he talked about how leading a controlled panic and so forth. He had acronyms for each of them and so forth. Now you'll probably look up uh, Patrick McManus. He's a pretty hilarious guy. But uh, the fact of the matter is, is that we're panickers sometimes. In our panic, we just head off. And we just go do something. And instead of just going to the Lord and saying, God, I'm in trouble. Or God, your servant is in trouble. Thy servant is in trouble. And it'll make you look bad <laughs> if you don't get him out of it. See, and God may say, you know what, I didn't get you into it. And then you have to get to your knees and say, God, you're right. I shouldn't be here. Thy servant is still here. <laughs> I repent for the things that got me here, but here I am. Now, God, show me what to do. God, lead me. God, give me. God, supply me. God, protect me. And God will. A father, a leader, wants to be a protector and a provider. Doesn't he? You know, there's something fulfilling for a man to provide for his family. It's natural. It's what God made men to be. When a man does that, it, it's a good feeling. We're made in the image of God, and uh, God wants to provide and to protect for His children. And my friend, if you think God doesn't love you, read Luke 11 sometime when God gives the illustration in the Lord's Prayer about how that if ye being evil uh, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? Just ask God sometime. Find out how much He loves you. He loves you dearly, dearly. That may be the first time I've said that this evening, but it's a truth. Woe unto them, woe unto them, the rebellious children. And their problem is they take counsel, but not of God. Their problem is, is that they will go to great lengths and great effort. They'll walk down to Egypt, but they will not ask at my mouth. You know, praying is a lot easier than investing, than carrying a load. So woe unto those individuals. They're trying to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh. And I want to look at that just briefly and we'll be finished this evening. Verse 7, the Bible says, For the Egyptians shall help in vain and to no purpose. Therefore, by cried concerning this, their strength is to sit still. It would be one thing, wouldn't it, if God said, Go to Egypt. Hey, look, you got Egypt. But God never did say, Go to Egypt, actually. And God said, Their greatest strength is to sit still. So you're going to haul off all your stuff on your camels. You're going to take it to a people that can't do anything for you. And they're going to look at you and say, there's a people that can't do anything for us. My friend, mark this down, file it, will you please? If you go to a man for help, the man will help you any way that helps him. Try going to a car dealer sometime and say, I need help getting a new car. They'll help you. Right? They'll help you into the most expensive car they possibly can. Right? Try going to someone who can profit by helping you and ask him for help. I need help. They'll be happy to help you insofar as it benefits them. And that's the attitude of Egypt. And but their attitude was, um, there's nothing in it for us. And my friend, that's really what it is most of the time when we look to men. There's nothing in us for them. So look to the Lord. And so we see that. The last thing, or I want to just summarize this evening with Psalm 37. Most of us have Psalm 37 memorized, I hope. 
you don't have it memorized, it'd be a good portion of scripture to systematically work for it for the scripture memory challenge. By the time you got done, uh, Brother Taj would run, what, 40 miles? That'd be a 40 mile passage of scripture. So it's worth 40 miles if you memorized it. And it'd uh, be easier than running. We talked about walking and talking, right? Tonight, usually for most of us, talking is easier than walking in Egypt. So memorize the scripture. Psalm 37 is where David really gives a perspective on the evil ones. I love how he begins, fret not thyself because of evil doers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down as grass wither is the green herb. And then he goes on to say, trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. And do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. He said, delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as the noon's day. Where we will conclude with 7 and 8. Rest in the Lord, and wait patiently on him. What was Egypt capable of doing? Their strength was to rest, to wait. Rest in the Lord. Trust, rest in the Lord. And wait patiently for Him. Oh man, we better do something. You know, you go ahead and pray, but I'm going to Egypt because we don't have time to wait on God. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently on Him. Fret not thyself because of Him who prospereth in His way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass, cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. If you were to read verse 9, you see, for evildoers shall be cut off. Evildoers are going to be cut off. So what can the wicked do? How much can they perform? How much danger are you in from an evildoer? Well, quite a lot if you're going to evildoers or to those who can't help you. But none at all if you're willing to believe God. And the conclusion, or I guess the challenge this evening, the application from our message is the simple question. Do you trust God? Do you believe Him? I know for a fact that this attitude that the children of Israel had of going to people that weren't God instead of going to God is one that all of us have emulated. And I know for a fact that no one who has ever put their faith and trust in God has ever been disappointed in the same. The question is, could you be quiet still enough to believe God? Instead of trusting someone who's just going to stand still, could you be still and trust God? I know that this passage of Scripture that we studied this evening will have application and has had application in each of our lives. And so we ought to know it. We ought to get a glimpse of God as a result of it. Father, thank you for what you've taught us from your word this evening. We ask that you would increase the truth of it in our hearts and our minds. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take some prayer requests this evening, shall we? How's me? Pray for the uh, Miller family and Madison.